Dennington, and today I have the privilege of sharing with you what God's Word has to say about women and their role in the church. Now, I am aware that some of the scriptures that we're going to be looking at today have been the subject of much debate in the body of Christ. However, we are not coming here today to debate, and we are not coming here today to prove one point or another, but we are simply coming to ask the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, to lead us into His truth and to bring us into unity. Because our goal is not to prove that we are right or that what we're doing is good. Our goal is simply to find out what God wants us to do and then just do it. And we have a, a guarantee from God that He's not going to leave us here as orphans. He, just, he, he doesn't expect us to just figure it all out by ourselves. He said that He was going to send us His Holy Spirit. And indeed, we have the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. The very first principle of love is that we're going to love God with all of our hearts, right? And the Bible says that we love God by obeying his commandments. So when we seek truth, we have to make sure that we are willing to obey whatever truth we find, okay? Because if we are unwilling to obey God, then we will not see anything in the Bible that tells us what we don't want to hear. You know, when we have lines that we draw and we say, okay, God, you can come this far, but no further. I will give you this much, but I will not give you any more. Okay, well, whenever we have these lines that we draw, then it is at that point that our spiritual blindness kicks in. Because anything in scripture that's going to show us that we're going to have to give more than we wanted to, that we're going to have to admit that we were wrong about something, that we were really kind of proud that we knew <laughs> you know any any place that tells us that we're going to have to crucify our flesh we're not going to see it because we've already decided in our hearts even though we may not admit this to ourselves in our minds we've already decided in our hearts that there are things that we won't do for God so we have to go in with the understanding that somewhere along the line in this journey we're going to be corrected and we're going to have to humble ourselves and we're going to have to make sacrifices that we really didn't want to make, okay? That is the journey that we're on. We have taken up our cross, and we're following Jesus, right? So we're going to go to these first two scriptures. And right now I want to start out by talking to the ladies. And specifically, I want to talk to the, those of you who are women in the body of Christ or who um, are husbands of the women in the body of Christ who teach the Bible, um, who are ministers or pastors who have those kinds of responsibilities in the body of Christ. And I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you right now. This is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, and I'm going to read to you the NIV translation of this verse. It says this, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. And then again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33b through 35, it says this. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Now, if you are a woman minister, these are probably the two scriptures in the word of God that you wish you didn't have to deal with, you know. And when you identify that, this is the caution I want to give you, ladies. When you identify that, uh, there needs to be a big red flag, a big neon light that goes off in your head that says, warning. Okay, because it is at this point that you know that your flesh is going to try to justify what you're already doing. Okay, and what you need to make sure of, ladies, is that you're not going to allow yourself to diminish these scriptures by adding your own words to it, adding other human words to it, or by finding reasons why it doesn't apply to you. Okay. And this is what I want you to consider today. Before we go on, we are going to look at some other things in Scripture. And, and by the time we are done, this is all going to fit together perfectly, okay? But before we get to that place, I really want to challenge you today. And I want to ask you this. Are you willing to even consider the fact that Paul might be talking to you when he says, be quiet? Is that like even a possibility in your mind? Or have you already predetermined that these scriptures don't apply to you? Because if you predetermined that, you would be better off closing your Bible, 
putting it aside and going off and making your own religion. It would be better for you to do that than it would be to pick up this holy word of God and mishandle it because the word of God is a holy thing and we do not have the right to manipulate it in order to make it make sense to us or to justify what we're already doing, okay? Now you're asking, how do I do that? What are you talking about? I don't try to twist the scriptures. Well, you know, it, it's a very common thing, and, and sometimes we don't even think about what we're doing, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples that I've heard, okay? Now, one theory that is used to explain these scriptures away and to justify women teaching in the church is um, the, the theory that the women in the congregations would sit on one side of the church and the men would sit on the other side, and that in Corinth, that the women were, were yelling their questions over uh, across the aisle to their husbands, and it was creating all kinds of chaos. And so Paul was only talking to the Corinthian women, okay? That's one theory. Then there's another theory that many of you have heard, and that was the fact that in that day and in that culture that women were uneducated and that men were educated, and so the women were asking silly, simple questions all throughout church and causing chaos in the congregation. And so when Paul talked to them and told them to be quiet, it was only because of the fact that they were uneducated. Now, I do realize that when you clicked on this video, being that I am a woman and I am a Bible teacher, you may have expected me to agree with these theories. You may have been expecting me to tell you that they hold some sort of validity. But this is what I would say to you, brothers and sisters. If I am willing to take human words, which is exactly what these theories are, human words that are not in the Bible, and use them to tell you that you don't have to obey Scripture, then you should turn this video off right now because I am not from God if I'm willing to do that. The Bible says we do not have the right to go beyond what is written, and it says we do not have the right to take away from God's words. Ladies, we cannot go into this with the approach that we're going to erase these words. They are unchangeable. God's, God's scriptures are perfect. You can't change them. You can't erase them. And if you try, and if you try to justify yourself in the eyes of men, you may succeed for a time. But in the end, you will not be justified before God. Okay? This is a holy matter. And so we need to go in this, into this with fear and trembling. All right? And if there is an explanation as to why... Paul states these things this way. It's going to be in Scripture. So now that we've allowed ourselves to take an honest look at our hearts and we've made a decision that we're not going to add to God's words, but we're going to wait for God to reveal his answers to us in his word, let's take a little bit uh, of a closer look at uh, what the Bible has to say about women speaking. Okay, we've just read two scriptures that seem to say that women should be silent in the church, that they shouldn't teach men, okay? But let's look at scripture and see what women we can find and what we can learn from those women, okay? We're going to start out in the Old Testament with Miriam. Now, Miriam um, was a prophetess, and we see this in Exodus 15, 20. It says, Then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. And then in Micah 6, 4, it says, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. Did you get that? Not only was Miriam a prophetess, and by the way, you can't be a prophetess without speaking, okay? <laughs> a prophetess means that you're going to be speaking the word of the Lord. Um, and, uh, but not only that, she also was appointed to help lead Israel, okay? And that means that she had a leadership position even over other men, all right? You can read about another prophetess in the Old Testament. Her name was Hulda, and you can find her story in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 14 through 20, or in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 22 through 28. I'll let you go and look that up yourself, and I'll tell you the gist of the story. Um, there was a good king of Judah. His name was King Josiah. And when the book of the law was found in the temple, it had been missing. And when it was found and read to him, he realized that Israel was in grave disobedience and that God was going to destroy them according to the promises in that book. And he wanted to have some, um, some further word on that. And so he sent his secretary, his priest, and his attendant to go and seek out the prophetess named Hulda to see what she had to say about those scriptures. Understand, a man, not only a man, but a king of Judah 
respected this prophetess enough that he submitted himself to her by sending his important men, his secretary and a priest. I mean, he could have asked the priest. He could have asked the secretary. He could have asked Hulda's uh, husband because she, she did have a husband. But this king of Judah recognized that the word of the Lord was with the prophetess. And he respected her enough to go to her and say, okay, what can you tell me about this? I need to know what the Lord says about this. And he respected the authority that the word of God gave to this prophetess. Okay, so that's another example that we see of women speaking and having authority and influence even over men in the Bible. The next woman we're going to read about is Deborah, and you can find her story in chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Judges. I'm going to start reading to you um, out of chapter 4, starting in verse 4. I'm just going to read some excerpts of these to you. It says, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time, or judging Israel, okay? She was the leader of Israel. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you, but because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zeb Zebulun and Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with them. And then it tells us in uh, chapter 5, actually it goes on to tell us that they indeed uh, went to war, and they won that battle, and the uh, commanding officer of the other army was indeed killed by a woman, and so a woman got the glory for that victory. And then it goes on to describe the battle and Israel's victory. And then in verse 31 it says, so may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but may they who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Then the land had peace for 40 years. Now, <coughs> this one is really interesting in the light of the scripture that we read earlier that says that women should not have authority over men. Because Deborah very obviously had authority over men. In fact, she had authority over all Israel. The commander of Israel's army obeyed her. She commanded the army. She wanted to give that authority and give that responsibility to Barak. And he said, I'm not going unless you go with me. And the Bible says that she was a prophetess. So she had the authority of God's word coming out of her mouth. Okay. And she was also the leader or the judge in Israel. The, the Israelites would come to her and have their disputes decided. So her word was final she was the judge and and they abided by her word okay and also it tells us that she was a leader that that helped Israel to come out of a time when they were absolutely ravished by their enemies and by war and the reason that it had come to them was because of their own idolatry but God rose Deborah um, rose Deborah up in order to lead them it says that there were 40,000 men in Israel and nobody was taking up a sword or a shield Okay, there are all these men, but they weren't fighting. They needed a leader. And the leader, interestingly enough, that God chose to raise up was a mother. And for those of you who think that this is simply an Old Testament phenomenon, we're going to move on to the New Testament with Anna the prophetess. We're going to read about her in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. It says, there was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying coming up to them at that very moment she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem now two things I want to point out to you first of all Anna was given the the privilege of prophesying over Jesus Christ when he was a baby when he was being dedicated to the temple that's a huge honor okay God uh, did not did not disdain Anna for speaking, all right? And she was speaking to men. She was speaking to Joseph, all right? These were the people of God. But not only was she prophesying, but she went out and declared to everybody. She told everybody that Jesus was the Messiah. She went and told everybody. And you know what they call that? 
It's called preaching, <laughs> proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he had come to bring redemption. So we see that Anna was not only a prophetess, but she was a preacher. And then we go on to read about Philip's daughters in Acts chapter 21, 8 through 9. It says, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And so, you know, we've got four prophetesses there in the, in the um, Acts church. And now we're going to talk about Priscilla, who was um, called Paul's fellow worker, okay? I'm going to read to you um, about Priscilla, and she was married to a man named Aquila. And you, you hear a lot about them in the New Testament church, okay, and in the New Testament and um, Romans chapter 16, 3 through 5 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, this is Paul talking, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. And then in Acts 18, 24 through 26, we see an interesting story about Priscilla and Aquila, okay? It says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. So what do we see here? We see that there was a brother who um, was actually a, a very good teacher, all right? But there was something that he lacked. There was a piece of knowledge that he still needed. And what does it say? It says Priscilla and Aquila explained to him what he didn't yet understand. Okay, so do you understand what was happening there? Priscilla, a woman, was teaching a man, all right? It could have just said Aquila taught him, but no, it said Priscilla and Aquila. They both helped explain the gospel to him. They both helped explain specifically baptism in the Holy Spirit to Apollos, all right? And this was a man that was highly respected in the church. He went on to help the church um, greatly. One more example, we have um, Phoebe. We read about Phoebe in Romans 16, 1 through 2. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the Lord in Chentria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Now, the word that Paul uses um, when he calls her a servant of the church in Chentria, that word in the Greek can also mean deaconess, okay? And um, if you read the definition in the Strong's, it says an attendant, that is generally a waiter at a table or other menial duties, specifically a Christian teacher and pastor, technically a deacon or deaconess, deacon, minister, servant. So this, this word that Paul uses to describe Phoebe, when it is applied to men, is usually translated deacon, okay? <laughs> but in, in this translation, they choose the word servant, which it can go either way. But the word means a pastor or a Christian teacher, okay? It denotes the fact that she was a worker in the church. And Paul wasn't condemning her. Paul wasn't saying, be silent woman. You shouldn't be teaching anybody. You shouldn't be um, have any uh, position of authority in the church. What did he say? He commended her, and then he gave them a command. He said, whatever she needs, you give it to her. Whatever help she needs for her work that she's doing, you need to give it to her, okay? Now, listen. It, you know, it would be very difficult for Phoebe to go into this church, into this congregation, and let them know what kind of help she needed for her ministry without talking. All right? So we have another indication here that, indeed, women did speak in the church. So here we are. We have other examples that we could look at, but, but we, we get the gist of this, okay? We've got scriptures over here that tell us that women should be silent in the churches and that they should never have authority over man. Then we have scriptures over here that tell us that God has put women in positions of authority over men in the Bible and that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, women have operated as prophetesses and teachers. Okay, so we've got a situation here where there appears to be a contradiction, and this is where we make our classic mistake. When we think we see a contradiction in the word of God, the first thing that we usually do is we run in and try to explain it away. 
because it scares us, okay? When we think we see a con- contradiction, we, 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 uh, we imagine that maybe God made a mistake or maybe God needs us to kind of cover up for him because he didn't quite speak that as well as he could have. And, you know, wh- what, will we, what will we do if the atheists get a hold of this? <laughs> what we really need to do is have a little bit of humility and a little bit of maturity, calm down, take a deep breath, and realize that God doesn't make mistakes. And God's word is perfect. The worst thing we can do when we come to a place in scripture that offends our intelligence, a place in scripture that appears to contradict other scripture even, a place in scripture that seems to say, oh, what God is saying doesn't make sense. The very worst thing that we can do when we don't understand something, brothers and sisters, is try to teach it. If the only way that you can explain a scripture is to offer up all the human theories on the subject, is to add human words and human reasoning to the Bible in order to make it make sense, that is a sure sign that God has not revealed the meaning of that scripture to you. We need to have the humility to say, I don't know. And brothers and sisters, no part of the body has everything that the body needs. If we don't have the humility to say, hey, there are mysteries of God that I don't understand, we're not really qualified to teach, are we? Because we're arrogant. And if we don't have the humility to submit ourselves to the fact that God is going to give one part of the body something that you don't have because he wants you to be dependent on each other, then, then how can we be part of his kingdom? It should not be so hard for us to admit that we don't have the answers. And if we don't have the answers, the very first thing we mu- need to do is to be quiet. This is what we have got to learn in the body of Christ. The reason that we have so many arguments, the reason that we have so much division is because whenever we come to a place in scripture that offends our intelligence, we just go right on and lean on our own understanding and and we create our own explanations and we add our own words and then we have a basis for argument because our words aren't perfect. What we need to do when we don't understand something in Scripture is trust in the Lord. That's what the Word says. It says, trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. See, this is a promise. And, you know, God would not tell us that we need to not lean on our own understanding if we're always going to understand everything. You see, God puts places in Scripture and God puts things in our lives on purpose that we are not going to understand. That is what Scripture says. It says he is going to offend our intelligence. He is going to destroy our wisdom. He puts these stumbling blocks in our path. Why does he do that? Because it's very simple. (laughs) You guys, he is building a kingdom here, all right? And if he has a kingdom of people who will only obey him when they understand his judgments, then they're not really obedient servants, are they? And if he has a kingdom of people who are only going to obey him when they think what he's doing is fair and when they understand it to be fair, then they're not always going to obey him, are they? So what he needs to build is a kingdom of people who have practice (laughs) at obeying when they don't understand and when they don't think it's fair. It's not that hard to get, you guys, okay? God deserves to have servants that are going to obey him. So these places in Scripture are there for a reason. These things are in our life for a reason. And we need to realize that God is watching to see how are we going to react. Are we going to obey him? Are we going to trust in our own understanding? Or are we going to do what he says and just trust in him and know that if we just acknowledge him in all of our ways, do our very best to obey him to the best of our understanding, that he will take the responsibility to make our paths straight. In the dust, my darling, oh, my beauty, oh, to Jerusalem, let's take your
Word.tv is committed to providing the Word of God free of charge to our viewers. If God is calling you to join us in His service by making a financial donation to this ministry, you can do so at www.thefinalword.tv.